Oh, and welcome back to Soteriology 101. As you can see, we have a guest with us today. This is Dr. Jonathan Williams. Welcome, Jonathan, to the program. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. I met Jonathan through Trinity Seminary, which, by the way, is a great place to get a higher theological education. If you're looking for a education, you should consider Trinity Seminary. Uh, I, I th think Jonathan would recommend it. I definitely recommend it as a, a, a adjunct professor with Trinity. Uh, many of you know Braxton Hunter, who's the president. He's been on the program several times. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Pritchett has been on the program several times. And those guys work with Trinity, and it's, it's an honor to be a part of that school. You can find a link in the show notes as well as at Sociology 101. Also, as, as scrolling there on the bottom of the screen, uh, we love our patrons and appreciate so much those who support this ministry. It is a listener-supported ministry, and so if you can help us spread the news of God's love and provision, please click on that support link and help us spread the news of God's love and provision for all people. Dr. Williams uh, just recently earned his doctorate. I was his advising counsel there, a, 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 a professor here at Trinity, and worked with him in his project, and ha that's how we got connected. Um, his paper was uh, in large part re a review of and interacting with John Piper's book, The Justification of God, uh, which is on Romans 9. And of course, John Piper is a very well-known Calvinistic uh, pastor. And, uh, and I think Dr. Williams did a wonderful job engaging with uh, John Piper's uh, book. And he's also an, an author of other books. And uh, the one we're going to be talking about today is, um, is, is called uh, The Story That Paul Was Telling. And uh, you're a storyteller, isn't that right, Jonathan? Tell us a little bit about your background. I know you've been a pastor for 35 years, right. over 35 years, and um, tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, well, as a preaching pastor, I learned the value of telling a good story in a good way at the right spot in a sermon. But, but beyond that, I developed a program uh, called Stories of the Master, and that's a retelling of the uh, life of Christ in 80 uh, approximately half-hour dramatic narratives where I bring in cultural and historical details. And those are the details that really make the stories come alive. And so uh, that program, Stories of the Master, opened me to the world of orality and how there is a tremendous need and how the Holy Spirit is working in mighty ways through storytelling around the world. And so you go into oral cultures where people don't know how to read or write, or if they do know how to read or write, they still prefer to learn through storytelling. Yes. And so we have a program uh, called the six C's, the letter C, the six C's of God's story for the world. And we teach people how to go through the Bible and give the essence of the Bible through storytelling. Hmm. I can't tell you how many times I have preached sermons uh, throughout my, my ministry and my life and have somebody come up to me at some later point in life and say to me, I remember the story you told about whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, even on this podcast, I'll get messages. And, and yeah, sometimes obviously it's about a particular point I've made or a quote that I've had. But most of the time, the comments are about, I remember a story. Right. I remember when you told that story. And, and of course, one of the best storytellers <laughs> that, that uh, in the world, uh, obviously the best, uh, is Christ. Jesus was a great storyteller. Um, he, he knows what communicates well, and stories do communicate well, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. I, I even read an article one time years ago that our brains are wired for storytelling. Yeah. We just um, receive matter better and we retain it better through stories. So let's use it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Kevin, thank you for the reminder on that. I, I meant to bring that up too, is to pray for Israel. Obviously, there's a lot going on right now. Uh, there are missionaries on both sides of the border there, um, some of which I know of. And I, and I would uh, highly appreciate. Matter of fact, look, Jonathan, can we just stop right now and just pray, um, not only for this interview, but let's just pray for Israel because I know that is that is a huge thing going on in our life right now, and, and one of those things that we can't we just can't pass over. So let's do that, Father. We do come before you, and I thank you for Jonathan, his work, and we were, uh, and what we're going to discuss today. I pray that you guide us as we discuss this. But um, we we just want to stop and pause and pray for Israel right now, Father, and all that's going on there. Um, the lives lost, the families affected. Um, many of us have been protected our entire lives, my, myself included, from war and from the effects and ravages of war on family. And, uh, and Father, we don't even uh, sometimes appreciate the fact that we have this kind of freedom to, to, to join together online and to have these kinds of conversations. But we just thank you for the opportunity to do this, and we do pray for those in Israel, and we pray for peace, Father. 
bring them the peace that only Christ can bring in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for that. Um, okay. I, I really want to dive in a little bit more into your, your storytelling with regard to Paul and most especially, obviously what we're interested here on this broadcast, because this broadcast was created for the, the doctrine of sociology in, in particular, the doctrines having to do with what Calvinism talks about versus what provisionists often talk about, um, what we talk about uh, with regard to how we understand Romans 9. Uh, my, my book, The Potter's Promise, I reached over here to grab The Potter's Promise, and I don't have uh, my copy of The Potter's Promise, but I do have my Spanish version. <laughs> so there is a there is a Spanish version out of the Potter's Promise now. If uh, you have if you speak Spanish or you know somebody who speaks Spanish, that that is available now on uh, Amazon. I didn't mean to to try to sell my book in the middle of that, but uh, th that's just what happened to be there. But in my book, the Potter's Promise, the largest section is on a verse by verse through Romans nine, and and you and I have much in common in how we understand Romans nine. But you you take it from a, a different. Um, you kind of come at it at a different angle. I come at it as kind of a systematic theologian because that's where my training is. Right. You come at it as a storyteller. Um, and, and I think it's really beautiful. And I think it really, I think, will connect with our audience. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on to, to, to recommend the book. By the, way, by the way, to get a copy of his book, look in the show notes. There's a link there that you can find that. It gives you information on how you can find Dr. Williams' book. Um, but, but I want you to talk about it a little bit more. Talk about Romans 9 from a Pauline standpoint, from Paul's viewpoint yes. as a storyteller, what story is he telling? Yes, well, uh, you can see it very clearly in Romans 9, the way it's structured, the verses 6 through 13 deal with the patriarchs, 14 through 18, the exodus, and then 19 to the end of the chapter deals uh, roughly with the, with the prophets. And so we see the sequence of Israel's history uh, right there in those three sections. But And the reason that Paul did that is because that's the way uh, the Jewish people would make their relationship with God uh, current and relevant for the generation in which they lived. Right. One of the things I discovered was that when uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 26, uh, Moses was telling the children of Israel, when you come into the land and when you present your first fruit off, first fruits offering to the Lord, what they were to do is they were to recite their story and bring it up to their mm -hmm. point. And so right there at the beginning, God instructs them to recite their history and their story. We see it in the book of Psalms. There's several, I believe Psalm 78, 79, 136 possibly. There's four or five Psalms that go through the history of Israel from creation to the Exodus and on through up to their date. We see it in uh, Nehemiah chapter nine, where uh, in the time of Nehemiah, the, when the people were making their great confession before God and entering uh, a new agreement, a new covenant with God, what do they do? They recited their history. And so this is very much a people who are story in, story oriented because they were a people of history in contrast to the pagan world around them where everything was circular and, and there was really no interaction between their gods and what was going on in the world. And so... Um, and then uh, after Nehemiah, that takes us to the intertestamental period. And we see several methods that the, that the Jewish people used. Uh, we see um, uh, the uh, allegorical method by Philo in, in Alexandria. We see uh, the Midrash uh, interpretive method, the Pesher interpretive method. We see it in the Apocrypha in the book of Ben Sirach, how, how he did the same thing. He went through the history of his people and he brought it up and he climaxed it with the priest in Jerusalem. So yeah. anyway, all this is to say that, that they were very much a story oriented people and they wanted to tell what God had done in their history. And we see it in the New Testament in Acts mm -hmm. chapter seven, where Stephen is on trial. And what does he do? He tells the story of his people and he shows how there is a history. There is a pattern of rejection of God's key leaders climaxing mm -hmm. in the rejection of the Messiah. And then we see it in Hebrews chapter 11, the same thing, beginning at creation, going through the key figures of history, all from the perspective of faith. Well, that's what Paul is doing in Romans chapter nine. He's telling the story of his people and he is saying, and he's doing it to answer the question about how can you say 
that the Messiah has come? How can you say that God's kingdom has been inaugurated if so many among our people are not believing? And so he said, mm -hmm. so basically he says, let me tell you the story of our people. And I want to show you some patterns of what has been happening. And that's the structure of Romans chapter nine. Yeah, that, that's really interesting you bring that up because there was some discussion that I was sitting in on. I can't even remember where it was. I just remember the discussion was about uh, the, the value of scripture um, and how important scripture is and inspiration, you know, the passing down of uh, the canon, why we have the canon that we have, all those kinds of questions, textual criticism questions that come up oftentimes. And some, some, one of the persons in that discussion was saying some very dogmatic statements about Scripture, and many of which I did, I did agree with, but there was some things he seemed to say that just kind of went over the top to the point where he, he almost made scripture into almost, you know, the fourth person of the Trinity or something. Yes. Um, and, and it made me wonder, you know, I started to begin to think about all the hundreds and thousands of people who never had a copy of scripture. And, and somebody was even talking about um, the Gutenberg Press is, is when that happened, when it was first printed, the Bible was first printed and how many thousands upon thousands of Christians never even had a copy of the scriptures or even knew much of the scriptures except for what was read to them, right. um, that much of what was passed down throughout the ages for, for generations upon generations yeah. were stories, people telling these stories over and over again. And, and that's why, that's why can't, Paul- can't underestimate that. Yeah, that's why Paul would tell Timothy, give attention to the public reading of scripture, because not everybody was walking around with a little pocket New Testament. So they, <laughs> they had to, uh, and I don't, I can't remember what the literacy rate was in, you know, in any given uh, village or city, but they would give attention to the public reading of scripture, which is also why Revelation 1, 3 says, blessed are those who read and those who hear and heed the words of this prophecy, because it would be read orally to yes. the congregations there. Yeah, yeah. well, and, and we, 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 this generation, especially younger generations that have been raised with the internet, um, those of us who are a little older can remember a time when internet did not exist um, and, and think now, how did we even figure things out back then? <laughs> how, did we, how did we function before email even, or before uh, internet, or before cell phones? You know, you have to, you have to kind of back up in your mind and think, what did I used to do? How did I used to communicate with people? How did I used to find out what the weather would be, you know, or how did I found out where I was supposed to drive to? Yeah, or all the kind of, yeah it's all right there. It's, it's, it's right here. It's sitting right here. Uh, and, and I, um, you know, and, and plus all of the, even the language stuff, you know, the things that I remember taking four years of languages to try to learn all these things. And now I can pull it up on an app things that I was having to apply to memory, which my memory uh, fails me often. And, and it's all right here. Yeah. And, and, and I, 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 I don't think we can overestimate how that impacts how we think about these things right. compared to how the average person throughout the generations, the, the kind of information at their fingertips versus the kind of invitation information at our fingertips and thus how those things are impacted. The, right. and even during the time of the, third, fourth, fifth century, when a lot of these things are being debated by the, the scholars of that day, you know, the, the big, the big names, John Chrysostom or, you know, Augustine or any of these guys like this, they don't, you don't realize how elite those types of individuals were to have access right. even to the amount of things they had access to yes. uh, compared to the average lay person. Um, and, and, and again, this may sound like a rabbit trail, but it really isn't. It's, it's, it's helping you to refocus your attention and think about it, how would have the first century church dealt with and, and thought about these things? Because more than likely, the letter to the people in Rome was probably read in their hearing. Yes. Um, and, and they would have had to understand it more like a story than a doctoral dissertation or some kind of a systematic reading. Exactly. Um, and, and that really does impact how you understand the text, right? Yes, yes, that, that, that is exactly right. So as they, as they heard uh, somebody reading it in their house churches, I believe that they would have picked up on the sequence that Paul was uh, taking people through as he got to what we call Romans 9. 
you know, with the patriarchs, the exodus, the, the prophets, they, they were used to that by then, and, and they grasped what Paul was doing. And we don't grasp that. And, and as you alluded uh, to this, we approach it um, so much in a systematic theology way. But the right, Bible right. was not originally a systematic theology. Uh, the Bible, as we all know here, that the Bible was originally a narrative. It was a story, a recounting of what God was doing in the world to reclaim what was lost. And, right, and right. Crucial. So that's the approach that that I took uh, in this in my book, and, and hence my title, Romans nine, and the story Paul was telling, because that's what's going on there. Yeah. So if the story Paul is telling is how are individuals uh, saved by a sovereign God who brings about all things, including our decisions, then maybe Romans 9 is teaching what Calvinists think it's teaching. But in, if, if it's really about Paul answering the question in the mind of his reader, uh, what about Israel? What yes. about God's promises to the nation of Israel? Right. Um, they're the they're the givers of the law. I mean, all of the promises are made through to Abraham t through their seed. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. He's he's promised Abraham so many things, and is God's promising promises are they are they failing? Because Israel, at least for the most part, all the major players in Israel. Um, they're they're rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. Right. Um, they're they're not, you know, they're trying to stone the Christians. They're trying to get rid of Paul. Uh, and so you you might just come along and think, well, I get I guess this is all over. I guess it's it's all done. Um, and 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 so you're what you're saying is the way Paul is answering that is by telling the story of Israel, right? Correct. And, and that's what the Jewish people did and had been doing for hundreds of years. That was that was how they did it. And so or I should say one of the one of the ways that, that they did it. This brings up a, another point that goes along very well with storytelling. And that is that we have to remember that. And I, I mentioned this in my book. We have to remember that Paul was not writing a dissertation in a library. Right, right. He was engaged in ministry and, and um, let, let's, let's use a combat metaphor. He was engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat a whole lot with, yeah. with Jewish people. And he had been doing this for, let's see, Romans was written about 56, 57, somewhere, somewhere in there. So he had been doing this in his journeys for uh, several years by this point, going synagogue to synagogue and telling people the story. And by the way, that reminds me of Acts 13. That's what he did in Acts chapter 13, where uh, they say, brethren, do you have any word for us? And and so Paul stands up and he starts speaking and he goes through the history of his people and he climaxes it with the death and the resurrection of Messiah and, and forgiveness of the kingdom now is offered to you. And so so uh, Romans is, uh, it is theological. There's a lot of good doctrine in it, of course, but it was forged in the fires of ministry as he was dealing with his people and trying to get their minds around a Roman crucified Messiah. How can the Messiah yeah. be a Roman crucified Messiah? And of course, the answer to that is the resurrection. And not, then, not only, a, not only a, a Roman crucified Messiah, but one they Yes. The Israelites yes. crucified. They're the ones who said, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus, yes. which is the very stumbling stone that he refers to in Romans 9. You have stumbled over the stumbling stone. You, which wh What is that stumbling stone? That your Messiah was killed by your own hands on a Roman cross. That yes. would definitely cause stumbling. I mean, that yes. would definitely uh, cause the Israelites of that day to to yes. stumble and to want to throw rocks, you know, and get, yeah. and get angry. And and let me just jump right into it. When when we read the Book of Acts, when we read the epistles, and when we understand the history of of a Second Temple Judaism, uh, we do not find a debate going on between so-called Calvinists and so-called Arminians. It just is yeah. not there. And so uh, this was not the issue that they were dealing with. 
Um, yeah, they talked a little bit about predestination. There were some implications here and there, but it was a hundred miles away from the modern soteriological debates between, let's say, God's sovereignty and human autonomy and, uh, or, and think, things of that nature. That just was right, right. not... The, that was not the topic of conversation in the first century, and that was not the burden upon Paul's heart. And that's not why Paul suffered. Paul did not suffer. He did not receive 39 lashes five times because he was a Calvinist going into our <laughs> synagogues. Yeah. Where, you know, we hear stories like that, you know, <laughs> in the times in, in which we live. The reason he received 39 lashes is because he was proclaiming the summoning block the, the uh, yeah. Christ of Messiah, who, but who's raised. And this was the real, this was the one that really set the Jewish people off. Gentiles are now equal members in the body of Christ without having to become a Jew. Yep, yep. That was the one that set off the fireworks. Uh, I, you can't, and you can't overemphasize that, Jonathan. Right. I mean, it, it, it's, it's like, if you don't know the question or the argument Right. that a person is answering, you cannot possibly follow their line of thinking. You have right. to know the, the topic that they are trying to unpack and handle before you start reading. That is a, that's a key to hermeneutics. And so if Paul is discussing things mostly, his, his big debate of his day is yep. with the Judaizers especially. Um, that's what Galatians is all about. Where he's, he's he, and a matter of fact, I just preached on this out of um, uh, out of Philippians chapter three, where he calls them dogs and mutilators of the flesh, um, and he does not mince words. Man, he 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 comes right. He's he's pretty uh, with the legalist of his days, the Judaizers of his day. He is not soft peddling anything. He would have been good on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, no, he was he was not happy with these people because that was those were his those were his interlocutors. Those were his yeah. debaters. Yeah. Those are the people he was debating with. And guess what they're saying? You've got to become a Jew. You've got to be circumcised and follow all of these rules in order for you to be a Christian. In order for you to come into the church, you need right. to become a Jew first. You got to clean yourself up first. And Paul's saying that's not the way it works and he's fighting against this. And and so what what why does that have anything to do with the whole Calvinism debate and the whole sociological debate? Well think about it. If you enter into Ephesians chapter one, for example, or Thessalonians, uh, where it says, "I praise God that He chose you," um, these, these kinds of these kinds of passages, and you have on your Calvinistic lenses, your sociological lenses on that, you read those passages. Oh, He predestined us before the foundation of the world. Oh, that this is about sociology and about Calvinism before the foundation of the world. Look what He's talking about. But when you have the Judaizing issue on, and you put those lenses on, you go, "Oh, okay." Paul's talking about exactly what he says over in Ephesians chapter three, that this has been God's plan from the beginning yeah. to bring in, to graft in the gent the Gentile peoples. Right. And so when he's referencing back to the foundation of the world, he's not referencing back to the foundation of the world because of some, you know, esoteric, you know, predestinarian type of language right. of picking certain people and damning the rest before they're ever born for reasons unknown to us. No, he's talking about this has been the beginning from the beginning that whoever is in Christ Jesus through faith, whether Jew or Gentile, right? it's always been God's plan from the very beginning that anyone and everyone who is in Christ will be made holy and blameless. Yes. We'll, we have all these spiritual blessings. And so whenever Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles, is writing to churches, predominantly Gentile churches that he started, and he's th saying things like, I praise God that he's chosen you from the beginning. Again, if you have the Calvinistic lenses on, what you hear is, oh, that means he's chosen certain individuals for salvation, effectual salvation from the beginning, and other people he's chosen to damn. No, but if you have the Judaizing lenses on, right. what, what, what do you see? Oh, I thank God that he's chosen you Gentile people from the beginning. This has been God's plan from the beginning, that through yeah. our gospel, you would believe and, re, and, and, and be saved through the, our gospel by grace through faith, that God can choose a covenant with whomever he wants to choose his covenant relationship with. Yes, even barbarian um, harlots Gentile from Gentile nations, he can choose to have relationship with them by grace through faith, yeah. which would have put the, the, the Pharisees especially uh, just up in ires and make them very angry that they right. would, how dare you say the God of Israel, the, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, our God would, would enter into covenant with a dirty barbarian uh, prostitute from a Gentile peoples.
And, and that's the big debate of that day. When you understand that and when you walk into these texts with that in mind, right. they really make so much more sense, don't oh, they? Absolutely. It, it fits like a hand in the glove. It fits comfortably within the first uh, century world. And so th those two points are crucial. The storytelling aspect and understanding what Paul was uh, was dealing with in the first century. And it had nothing to do with the, with the modern soteriological debate. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that that some of those issues obviously are not discussed in Scripture, as you've already mentioned, that there's not soteriological doctrines being taught throughout the, the, book, the books of, of the New and Old Testament, for that matter. Um, it, obviously, there are, and that's one of the reasons we discuss the things that we discuss. Yeah. But in, 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 so some people, they'll hear somebody say things like that, and they'll think, okay, so there's no application to soteriological, you know, implications of our discussion. No, there's a lot of really, really great in-depth soteriological implications yeah. from the things we learn. But you have to interpret the passage in its proper context, yeah. dealing with the actual issue that the author is attempting to deal with, in order to apply those things rightly to yeah. whatever soteriological discussion you may be having. Right. And so, so, so some people see our explanation of the context as saying, oh, well, he's just throwing out that passage. Yeah. He's just saying it has no relevance to us whatsoever. I've been accused of that by some Calvinists. I'm not going, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying right. you're misapplying the relevance because you're not understanding the context in which the author is speaking. And the only way you're going to apply that rightly is if you understand what he's talking about before you jump in and draw conclusions based yeah. upon your own that's worldview. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, amen to all that. Yeah, very good. very good. I wanted to ask you, as you were kind of working on this particular book, the 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 story of Paul, the story that Paul was telling, mm -hmm. um, as as you're, you know, kind of walking people through that as as a story from Paul's perspective. What do you think are some things that maybe Paul was anticipating in the mind of his readers? Because he's telling this story, and he, he's he's kind of known for his diatribe kind of stuff, where he uh, he anticipates what his his you know his audience might be thinking. Um, do you see Paul doing that even as he's telling his story, where he kind of pauses or takes little rabbit trails to answer his potential interlocutors uh, well, through a diatribe? Uh, well, some people, including John Piper, I don't think he's wrong on this. See verses fourteen through twenty-three. It's kind of a subpoint to the to the whole thing, and so verse fourteen begins one of those interlocutors where he's saying uh, uh, about how uh, God is unjust and based upon what he has said previously, and then we see it again in verse nineteen where he deals with an interlocutor, uh, and and again I don't think he's just making it up. I don't think it's just theoretical or hypothetical. I I think these are questions that he had to deal with time and again. And so, uh, and they must have, for him to pick those two that he mentioned in verse 14 and verse 19, they had to be fairly common. They had to come up quite frequently. I'm sure there were others, but those had to be the most common for him to yeah. listen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I know that, um, that I, I, you know, I've encouraged you obviously to turn your dissertation into a book. Um, and to you know make it uh, very accessible for the the average uh, layman reader, um, it's not unaccessible as the way it's written, even as a dissertation. But um, you know how it is; you can take out some of the right. uh, you know uh, academic uh, language right. and those kinds of things, and make it you know put put more stories and those kinds of things in it right. uh, to illustrate certain points, which is uh, what I look forward to seeing once you get there. But um, you, you you mentioned that your working title is the Edomite Enigma. Jacob, Esau, their descendants, and Paul's words in Romans nine, ten, uh, Romans chapter nine, uh, verses ten through thirteen. Yes. Um, if you don't mind, help our audience. Maybe somebody who's tuning in for the very first time, and you'll hear them ask the question: What about Jacob and Esau? I mean, the Bible clearly states, "Jacob, I loved; Esau, I hated." Right. That seems to, at first reading, if nothing else, to say that Jacob he he wants Jacob to be saved. He loves Jacob salvifically. He wants him to be saved, but Esau not so much. He's he's chosen him for damnation, right. and um, and that's what that's really about. What what would you say to someone who has that impression of that passage, for example? Yeah. Well, I I would. I, I would t just give them a personal testimony. I would say that uh, uh, somebody uh, somebody put a pebble in my shoe one time, or, or maybe I just read it in scripture uh, about the history 
uh, again, intertestamental period, I remembered that John Harkanus, one of the descendants of the, he was one of the Maccabees, uh, he did not go down to the Edomites and destroy them, annihilate them, but he did go to war against the Edomites. And once he conquered the Edomites, guess what he did? He brought them within Israel. And I thought, well, that's interesting. They became, the Edomites became part of the covenant people. And so that began uh, a search and an inquiry on the history of the Edomites. So I, I chose to uh, write my dissertation uh, upon verses 10 through 13. You had to get very narrow and very focused on a, on a mm -hmm. dissertation. And so I went back to the story of Jacob and Esau. One of the things I discovered with Jacob and Esau is that Esau was not cursed by his father, Isaac. That's kind of a that's kind of a misunderstanding. We assume that he blessed Jacob and he cursed Esau. No, Esau says, Father, don't you have a do you have only one blessing? Don't you have a blessing for me? Well, Esau didn't uh, or Isaac didn't say, no, I only have one blessing and you're cursed from the foundation of the world <laughs> to put words into his mouth. And so he blessed uh, his son Esau. It wasn't as good a blessing as what he gave to Jacob, but it actually says that in Hebrews 11 by faith, Jacob blessed Jacob and Esau. They both got mm -hmm. a blessing. And so, well, so did so did Ishmael. You know, and a lot of people don't what? recognize that too, but because it, you know the, the dichotomy is between Isaac and Ishmael, and then Jacob and Esau. But yes. Ishmael also was exactly. uh, was blessed, and and Abraham prayed for him and uh, yeah. and desired good for him. Obviously, yes, and, and God did good, and, and He blessed Ishmael and his posterity. He did the same thing with Esau. So so that led into a study of the Edomites, and I said about their land and their, their culture, the geography, and and it was a wealthy nation. It did. It did very well long before Israel did well because of the blessing that God had upon them. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, I believe it's it's either in Deuteronomy 2 or Deuteronomy 23, where it says that God fought for the Edomites. We think that God fought only for Israel, but God fought for the Edomites to displace the people, I believe it was the Horites, who were in the Edomite territory. And God fought for the Edomites so that they could have their inheritance that God promised to them. And then, of yeah. course, we have the uh, the verse in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23, where where God promised that the Edomites could come in to the worshiping assembly of Israel and worship God. So we see these verses uh, about the Edomites and we see that God did not place a curse upon him and his descendants from the foundation. I think it's that, that same chapter that says God says, do not despise the Edomites for yes. they are your brothers. That's um, exactly so, right. you know, if, if the word hatred in, in Paul's mind literally means to despise, then that would make God into a hypocrite yeah. where it seems to be that, that that's not the point Paul's making with regard to the choice of one brother over the other through which the Messiah would come. And the, the, the blessing of the reason you choose the nation of Israel, the reason we chose the nation of Israel for the, was for the blessing of all the nations of the world. Exactly. Uh, the Edomites were not chosen for that noble purpose. That doesn't mean that they could not be blessed. Remember, the, the original promise was, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. So uh, the, the Edomites very well, uh, by that condition, would have been blessed if they continued to follow God and continued to believe. Exactly right. But if what happens when they curse Israel? What happens when they attack Israel? That's exactly what the promise said will happen. I will curse those who curse you. Right. And so when the Edomites attack Israel, um, that's when he pronounces out of Malachi that curse, uh, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated, yeah. Yeah. Um, right. referencing and many, that, that and curse. Many other, many other prophecies. In fact, uh, Dr. Pritchett pointed this out to me in one of the classes, and that is that there are more prophecies against the Edomites than any other nation. It's kind of surprising. Uh, that way, but they're but they're historical judgments for yep. cursing the Israelites and for the conflict that that they had. The real kicker uh, for me uh, regarding the Edomites uh, was the prophecy in Amos uh, chapter nine about uh, restoring the fallen booth of uh, David and how Israel will possess uh, the land of its possessors, and it talks about the Edomites there. And so you have this idea in the Old Testament of Israel going in militarily and taking control of those lands, not annihilating mm -hmm. the people, but taking control of them, and then they would come into the nation. But I, I think, Leighton, I think this is just so amazing. In Acts chapter 15, 
when uh, they have the Jerusalem Council and when they're settling the issue, not on sovereignty versus human autonomy. That's not that wasn't the issue, but they're settling the, the issue about Gentiles coming in right. to the elect people of God by grace through faith as equal members. That was the issue. Yeah. They substantiate that biblically. And so James goes back to a prophecy in Amos chapter nine and uses that as a as the uh, as the foundation for the Great Commission. Hmm. And so a prophecy of judgment on the Edomites is turned around and becomes a prophecy for blessing going to the Edomites and all the nations. So what the point I make uh, that I made in my dissertation uh, is that that Jerusalem Council was just a few years before Paul wrote Romans. It is inconceivable that Paul would see the Edomites as the foundational nation, as a foundational verse, that the prophecy about the Edomites as a foundational passage for the Great Commission, and then turn around and say the Edomites were predestined for damnation from the foundation of the world. It, it, hmm. It's inconceivable. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So those are the uh, some of the things that I explored uh, in my dissertation. I've, I've read so many uh, different works on Romans 9, even in my own studies and in uh, being a professor and reading other people's work on it. So forgive me because I don't recall exactly all the points and arguments that you made in particular. And so uh, f forgive me on this particular question because I cannot remember if you made the same link that I tried to in my book with regard to how the Edomites are very similar to the modern day Israelites in, in Paul's day because if the Edomites, who are the firstborn of Isaac himself, I mean, if, if anybody has the qualifications of being of Abraham's seed, it would be Esau and the Edomites. I mean, they were the direct lineage of of Abraham, the oldest. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, he they were the more qualified of. I mean, they were more qualified than the Israelites as far as being that that uh, the, the of the flesh of Abraham. Yep. And yet what what happened to them? They were cursed because they stood against the people chosen to carry the gospel, yes. to carry Christ, to carry the message. And what are the Israelites doing in Paul's day? They are standing against the disciples, those chosen by Christ to spread the gospel. They're doing exactly what the Edomites do. And so it's like the Israelites, the Pharisees of Paul's day, are modern day Edomites. Yes. And, and it's as if Paul is saying, look at this curse on the Edomites. That's the same curse on you guys because you're standing against the promises of God. The reason God elected Israel is to carry this word to the world and you're trying to stop it just like the Edomites did and therefore you're under his curse just like they were. Yeah, That parallel to me seems to be screaming off the page. Oh, yes, did you yes, see it as well? Cool. Is that, is that something you brought out as well? Uh, y y yes. Uh, and not only the, the Edomites, but um, the Israelites in the first century were acting like Pharaoh. And so he goes back and he talks about Pharaoh and God hardening Pharaoh's heart. But in chapter yes. 11, he talks about God hardening the unbelievers within Israel. So the Israelites were acting like the Edomites. They were acting like ancient uh, Pharaoh, the ancient Egyptians and Pharaoh. And it's just a, a turn of the table. Uh, Jesus did the same thing where he upbraided the cities of uh, uh, woe to you, Capernaum and Bethsaida and and uh, and uh, one other city that uh, village that escapes my mind right now. But he quoted from Isaiah 14, where it's the prophecy against the king of Babylon in Isaiah chapter 14. And Jesus uses the terminology reserved for the downfall of the king of Babylon. And he applies it to the people in the villages who would not believe him. And so we see Paul doing yeah, the, the yeah. same thing. Yeah, yeah and that's yeah, cool. that's an, that's another parallel that that I, I bring out. And I actually, in, I actually quote from N.T. Wright because he brings that parallel out yeah. to that the the Israelites are are being hardened uh, in the same way that Pharaoh was hardened to bring about the first Passover. Israel is being hardened to bring about the second Passover. And that kind of parallel, that kind of foreshadowing, is seen throughout the scriptures. We see that quite regularly. Um, you know, and, and 
What's interesting about this, when you have these kinds of discussions, Jonathan, there's, I know you're not looking at the side chat, but there's, there's Calvinists that jump in every once in a while on the side chat and they'll say things like what Aaron Fisher, who's a resident Calvinist that, that jumps in every once in a while, he'll say, oh, the gymnastics. Um, and, and I remember having this kind of feeling when I would listen to certain Calvinists describing, I mean, or certain non-Calvinists describing their particular interpretation of a text that I always thought was just obviously Calvinism, you know? Yep. And I would think, oh man, alive, they're just going through all kinds of gymnastics to try to make their doctrines fit. In, in reality, I look back over that time in my life now and I just kind of, oh my gosh, I was, I was so blinded to what they were talking about because I was so set in my way of thinking. The lenses of my Calvinistic worldview were so entrenched into my way of thinking yeah. that anybody who started going into any kind of in-depth of, about the foreshadowing of the Edomites with regard to how that relates to the Israelites or Pharaoh being hardened in the same way that Israel is being hardened. All of those things just seemed, it was just like, it was kind of like the, uh, the, the adults on the, the peanuts cartoons, yeah. uh, Charlie Brown cartoons that yeah. wah, 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 wah. It just, it did, it didn't ever register. It, it just, it would enter in one ear and out the other because I was so in a sense hardened in my Calvinism. Yeah. I wasn't willing to objectively really evaluate what they were saying. Not, not only that, but I wasn't even willing to really try to really understand the point they were making in order to validate that they may actually have a point worthy of my consideration. Right. I would do exactly what I see Aaron doing. Oh, that's just gymnastics. I don't have to deal with it. Yeah. And, and I, I don't have to have to think about it. Yeah. Um, you know, I had somebody mention something like that to me a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and, he, and and I think he brought up N.T. Wright also. He says, oh, you're, you're just like N.T. Wright, and uh, you're, you're trying to bring all this historical stuff in, in, uh, into the first century. And, and I was thinking, you know, if we don't, what are we going to bring to the passage? We're going to bring our 21st century presuppositions into it if we don't try to understand it mm -hmm. within the, the uh, first century. So um, maybe it would be good, too, if I just shared a little bit of my testimony on that, yeah, I, I was do. in um, um, fundamentalist, independent Baptist churches. I'm from San Antonio, Texas, and so so we went to little churches like that. I'm grateful for it. My parents led me to Christ when I was five years old, and uh, then when I was 14, they put me into a Christian high school. And the pastor and the headmaster of that school it was the pastor of the Bible church. We had never heard teaching like this going through uh, verse by verse. We'd always heard topical messages on salvation with an altar call in our little mm -hmm. Baptist churches. And so um, so we thought, man, this is the best we've ever heard in our lives. Well, he was going through the book of Romans and he was discovering Calvinism. And so we resisted the Calvinist teaching, but finally we submitted to his teaching of Calvinism. And so I was about uh, 15 or 16 years old at that time when I became a Calvinist. And so I held on to it for about six years when finally I had to let it go. And here's why I let it go. And it wasn't because, and I'm speaking now to the person who made his comment about gymnastics. It wasn't because I had this doctrine of free will or whatever, and I was trying to make passages fit into that. It, that wasn't the situation at all. I staunchly held to my Calvinism. And I would debate people uh, on it, and I could I could get mean sometimes with, with people. <laughs> I was I was often in the flesh rather than in the spirit in in those uh, debates. But I kept. But God was gracious. He was merciful. And uh, so as I continued to study scripture from beginning to end, I was just very interested on how everything connected from the book of Genesis yeah, yeah. all the way through the, uh, the Old Testament to the Gospels. And, the, and I was very interested in the continuity of the story. And so I would take a topic and I would begin in the Old Testament. I would look up the key words and I go through all the verses in the Old Testament into the New Testament. I would look up all these words. Well, I decided to do that on the word elect or choose or chosen, all of those words. And so I began with the with God's election of Abraham. And I thought, well, that's really interesting in verse three. This is the climax of why God chose Abraham. In you, I will bless all the families of the earth. And so I begin to see that election was not about unconditional election to salvation from the foundation of the world, 
but it was about God's election of Abraham and his descendants for the sake of the non-elect. And so I, as I got deeper and deeper, and as I saw more and more verses on this, and as I saw how everything fit together, as I saw the story of Scripture, I began to see that my square peg of Calvinism did not fit into the round hole of the narrative of Scripture. Hmm. As much as I tried to get it to fit into that, it just wouldn't work. And so I said, I've got to let it go. It's just not there in Scripture. And so, yeah. and so that's how I began then to study uh, these doctrines from the perspective, not from the perspective of Arminianism. I didn't even have a systematic theology then, but I began to study them through the perspective of the entire. About community. what year was that, uh, Jonathan, when you kind of transitioned out of Calvinism? Well, I was 22 at the time. I'm going to be 70 next year. So that's about 50 years ago. So, uh, okay, so, so I'm 40, I'm 49 years old. And so um, that happened before I was born. Yes. And yet, oh, wow, you're making yet, me feel really old. <laughs> well, sorry, I, I'm 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 just pointing that out because there already has been on the side chat and in other places. I know you've mentioned um, the accusation. You you're just following Leighton, or you're just you're just influenced by Leighton, or like you're you're one of those provisionists getting it from Sociology 101. I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me, I, I had a, a message just in my inbox the other day, a pastor accusing a guy of Leightonism. And he said, I didn't even know what that was. I had to find you online to figure out why he was accusing me of, of this. Yeah, And it's like, it's like people have this in their mindset that they have to find the boogeyman to blame for all these yeah, people yeah, coming yeah, to this yeah, conclusion yeah, independently right. of each other. But obviously, that's not how you came to these conclusions because yeah, well, I, I wasn't so even was, I wasn't even born. <laughs> it was around the years uh, 1975, 1976 that that mm. I was making the change. What year were you born? 74. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have okay, I would have so, been two two years old. Yeah. So, so that was very old. precocious of you, being a, a year or two old, to influence <laughs> me in that way. You're you're just amazing. So, yeah, that that's how that happened. So uh, that long yeah. ago. Yeah, and I, I, I had to point that out just because I know that uh, there are people who are going to listen to things like this and think that that and, well, and that's one of the reasons I, I invited you on the program, uh, Jonathan, is because when I when I read your dissertation and begin to kind of talk to you through the yeah. uh, you know our you know review, um, you you were saying a lot of the same things that I've come to the conclusion of, but you came to it from a totally different perspective Correct. and a different world for me. Um, and, and I've, I've done this. I found a book the other day that was published back in 1991, back when I was, you know, I was still becoming, I was com becoming a Calvinist back in that, those days. Um, and reading a, a book that came to some, comes to the exact same conclusions I do with regard to a lot of the sociological findings and just reading this book and the guy, I look up the guy to try to figure out and he's, he's actually gone on to be the Lord now, but, um, but, but I love finding these other scholars and ministers who independently have come to the same conclusions. In fact, you even note this, I think it was you that noted this in your dissertation, if I'm not uh, mistaken you for someone else, but there, there are some quote unquote Calvinistic reformed scholars, um, commentaries that actually interpret passages out of Romans nine, the same way that you and I do, hmm. but yet, inexplicably still hold to Calvinism. Yeah. Didn't you find that too? Oh, well, well yes. One of them was, uh, it is Douglas Moo, yep. uh, tremendous commentary, thick, tremendous commentary on, on the book of Romans. And when he talks about uh, Romans 9, chapter 13, and I had to go, in my interaction with John Piper's book, he strangely doesn't say anything about verse 13. And so I, I went to uh, Douglas Moo's commentary on Romans to see what he said about verse 13 and he gives an unbelievably convincing argument for why he's talking corporately in verse 13 and not individually about God's love for the individual Jacob and God's hatred of the individual Esau. And then he says, however, in spite of these very strong arguments, I think it's talking about unconditional election. And he goes on with some of the skimpiest arguments. It, it, it's, Honestly, I, I, I would, if I were, if he were in front of me now, I would say it's embarrassing. I'm sorry, Dr. Mo. So, yeah, uh, there, there are several commentaries like that, that that I've picked up over the years. 
just because, you know, in my studies, because this is something I wrote my, my dissertation on back in the day, I'm, I'm obviously of interest in it since I have a podcast on it. I, I'm also I often asked what, you know, commentator commentaries I recommend. And so every time I'm in a, a bookstore library of any kind, and I see a commentary of that I'm not familiar with, I'll pick it up and begin to look through some of the, the major texts just to see kind of where they've landed. And it, it's amazing to me how many times I will come across uh, commentary commentaries that that virtually come to the same conclusions that I've come to with regard to a lot of those individual texts. Yeah. But some of them, not all of them, will still will still kind of put the caveat in there. But but nonetheless, Reformed theology is still right. Yeah. Or, you know, basically, with, yeah. not in that exact language, but basically, yeah. yes, this is probably, this is not about this and this is not about that. It's not about God hating one person before they're born and, and loving another and really give an explanation of that's, that, you know, that's a high, hyper, maybe kind of Calvinistic view and they'll even dismiss that. But then they'll still draw uh, ultimately a, a Calvinistic conclusion from the text because even Calvinist. while arguing against it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me say two things about this. Uh, one, to go back to verse 13 one more time. Uh, when Paul said, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. What I discovered in my studies is that twice in the Old Testament, God said he hated Israel. It didn't say he hated their behavior. He said, I hate Israel. He only said it once about the Edomites. He said it twice about his covenant people, twice as much. And so, you know, one of the things I argue in, in my new book that's just coming out and in, in, uh, also in my dissertation is that, therefore, uh, that's the way they talk. That was covenant language. And, and it cannot right. be about um, predestination before the foundation of the world where God determined that he was going to hate them. So that's a, the first thing. The second thing I want to mention is that we do find in some Calvinist books, some good insights, and I read Calvinist authors uh, for various reasons. And um, um, John Piper attempts. To, John Piper recognized that problem, and and in his book, The Justification of God, very early, he says, "I want to show that we do not have to abandon the history." And the, we do not have to abandon the historical context, but that we, we can substantiate the historical context of the Old Testament that fed into Paul's words without giving up our Calvinism. And that's really the purpose of his book, because he knows that is a problem, but he yeah. utterly yeah. failed in it. Yeah, uh, Samuel Carter is... Uh commenting there it's a great point god hated israel not just the edomites or esau uh, also hate just means to count as an enemy in hebrew but jesus also reminds us to love your yeah. enemies yeah, you can really you can love and hate at the same time yeah and that's, that's one of the points i make in my book that those are not mutually exclusive terms in the covenant language because you can you can hate somebody in the in the sense that they're they are your enemy and they're cursed under the curse of your righteous law but you can still desire their well-being. You can desire for them to come out from underneath the curse and yeah. to be healed. So in that sense, you can love and hate at the same time if you're understanding that from a biblical covenantal you know, perspective. You know, Layton, we, we pray for Israel at the beginning, and, and actually you, you pray there's people, missionaries on both sides. You know, We absolutely hate what those people did a, a couple of days ago. It's just gross, and you, yeah. just, you just want to take revenge. You want to hate them. But... They need the gospel. They, they're yeah. living by an ancient narrative of revenge, and it's just going to perpetuate itself. And we understand that. And, the, and yeah, we want security for Israel, but ultimately they have to hear the gospel and be set free. And that's yeah. A, yeah. I, I think that's a great current illustration yeah. of what we're talking about here. You mentioned storytelling. One of the one of the things I remember referencing in, in my book as well on the same topic was, you know, if you imagine, for example, uh, you know, Jonah. Um, Jonah was a chosen vessel of God. Um, there's no doubt he was chosen. Obviously, God picked him. Yeah. He wasn't. It doesn't say anything about him being picked for salvation, uh, effectual salvation, or anything of that nature. But it does talk about him being chosen to be a messenger to take the message of, of God's 
grace and forgiveness to the Ninevites. Yeah. Um, and you know the story. Uh, he doesn't want to go. So he, he is a rebellious elect person. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. So not only is he elect because he's a Jew, but he's elect because he's a, a elect Jew called to be a messenger of God. And he, he rebels. And so he takes off. Now, if you just paused right there in the middle of that story, yeah. while Jonah is sailing away to Tarsus, trying to get away, you might come to the conclusion, well, I guess God's promise has failed mm. because God promised to take the message to the Ninevites. And look, the messenger he chose to take the message to the Ninevites isn't willing to go, so God must fail. Well, if somebody came to that conclusion, what would you do to combat that conclusion? You would tell the rest of the story. You would tell the whole story. Well, yeah, he was rebellious, but guess what? God has has uh, at his fingertips ways in which to get his messengers to do what he's called them to do, even when they're rebellious. Yeah. And so he uses normative, relatively normal normative means, a storm, uh, much like he uses a bright light with Paul. Uh, he he makes sure that the person he's chosen to be a messenger takes his message where he wants it to go. And so proof that God uses these outward external means to convince his messengers to go where he has called them, chosen for them to go, doesn't prove that God has individually chosen which Ninevites are going to be effectually, irresistibly changed by some inward secret means causing them to believe the message that Jonah brings. And that seems to be the stretch that the Calvinistic interpretation brings to these kinds of texts. They seem to be reading into the scriptures this concept and idea that look at how God chose the nation of Israel and chose individuals, therefore, a la Calvinism, effectual salvation of individuals. And really, it's about God's choice of this nation called Israel to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth and individuals from that nation, like the prophets, like the apostles, to bring the message individually. And sometimes they're rebellious, but God can and does intervene to ensure his message is taken to where it wants it to go. And how do you make that argument by telling the whole story yeah look at it all which means we don't stop in romans 9 we go on to chapter 10 and chapter 11. (laughs) and so paul begins paul begins chapter 11 and he says has god rejected his people no look at me you know paul paul was a murderer i was a murderer you know i was hardened in my sin and god saved me and and paul goes on to say that his burden was that those that he talked about in Romans 9, who are hardened, that that hardening can lift and they can be regrafted back into the olive tree. Mm-hmm. So you got to read the got to read the whole story. Um, Aaron makes a, a uh, argument um, that well, let me just put it up here. We'll, we'll, we'll see if you want to deal with this one. He says, I guess Layton would argue that Jacob was chosen for service to carry on the lineage of the Christ. And that it was possible for Jacob to never be saved. His election was only to service, not to salvation. And earlier he had made the point, so, uh, well, if God chooses somebody for service, then he must have chosen them for salvation because they can't serve unless they're saved. And so if he's going to choose them for a service, he has to effectually save them. So it's the same thing. And so what ultimately he seems to be arguing is that if Jacob was chosen for this service, then he must have effectually caused Jacob to be saved, right? How would you respond to something like that? Well, I would say that God chose Cyrus, his anointed one, for the purpose of restoring Israel back to the land so that the the exile could come to an end. But his choice of Cyrus, his anointed one at that time, did not mean that Cyrus was necessarily saved. And so... God's election uh, for one thing. So God elected people for all kinds of things to do all sorts of... Uh, Saul, the king. Yeah. But yeah. salvation comes by grace through faith. Right. Well, and there, there are people who are in the lineage of Christ um, that in the scriptures give no indication of their necessarily being saved. So they were chosen for the noble purpose of being the lineage of the Messiah, but weren't necessarily saved. Um, you think of... Uh, Kings, so many kings that were chosen by God, but still rebelled and were cursed because of that. The whole question reveals a modern evangelical perspective that's imposed upon the passage. Because Jacob was brought into the covenant when he was circumcised. Eight eight days after he was born. Mm 
And so he was part of the covenant people. He was part of the elect people of God when he was circumcised. And so we're, we're just looking at it so individualistically uh, from a modern salvation discussion rather than understanding that their election was to carry the covenant purpose forward. And of course, if God's carrying the covenant purpose forward, then um, uh, then the, the chances are highly likely that they will be saved. And let me give you another example that just popped into my mind. When was Abraham justified? Well, he wasn't justified until Genesis 15. And yet, by faith, he responded to God's call on his life. He leaves his people, his land, his country. He goes to a land by faith, exercising faith before he's even justified. He follows God. He builds altars and he worships the one true God. And we have to assume that God was was enjoying that worship and God is leading him all along to the point and using him and giving him the purpose of blessing the whole world, even before he was justified by faith. It could yeah, be the same thing. Great. It could be the same thing with, with Jacob. God, God chooses him for this purpose and he works in his life to bring him to a point where he really exercises faith. I, I like to um, kind of shock Calvinists sometimes when I'm talking to him and I say, I believe Pharaoh was elect. Don't you? No. No. What are you talking about? Pharaoh was elect. I said, well, the Bible says he's elect. I mean, he doesn't. He does not. He, Pharaoh wasn't elected. Of course he was. Elected just means chosen. You're the one reading into the word chosen. He was chosen to be effectually saved. I didn't say that. I just said he was elect. The Bible says, I have chosen you. I've raised you, Pharaoh, up for this very purpose that yeah. my name might be proclaimed, might be made known through you, manifest through you. He was chosen. He was elect. That's why you always have to ask the question, cho who was chosen and for what exactly. <laughs> were they chosen? And once you understand that there are a lot of people chosen for different things and people can fulfill a purpose of God in the lineage of the Messiah and for the purposes that he created Israel or uh, chose Israel um, without being individually saved, without ever having faith in God. Right. Um, they can still be chosen of God for a particular purpose, and God can accomplish his purpose through them. The nation of Israel is a perfect example of that. They're a chosen nation, but not necessarily a saved nation. Well, there you go, right and there. That's the whole thing right there. Just like Pharaoh, chosen man, but not necessarily a saved man. Right. Jonah, a chosen uh, messenger, but not necessarily a, a um, obedient messenger. <laughs> so... Yeah, well, uh, when we look at Romans 11, uh, Paul, Paul said, uh, they're enemies for your sake, uh, for the gospel's sake, but they're still beloved for the sake of the fathers. And he calls them elect. And and yet, yeah. he, and yet so these elect people, he's praying for their salvation in Romans 10, 1. So. Well, I think the point you made about the journey that somebody goes on, you think about Peter, for example, um, you, you talk about a heretic. Before his dream with the sh white sheet let down, oh, yeah. he didn't think that the gospel would should go to pe Gentiles. Right. I mean, that, that's a heretic. If anybody's a heretic teaching a that's false right. doctrine, it would be somebody who doesn't believe that the gospel's for everybody, but only for the Jewish people. Um, that, that is a her heresy upon heresies. And yet he believed that until right. God corrected his error. Right. Um, I even make this argument, and I'm not sure it's the most popular view, but I think there's a strong case for the fact that Paul was a, a believer in God, Yahweh, truly, oh, right. tr truly yeah. was had zeal but not knowledge, like he says right. in Romans chapter 10. And, and the road to Damascus experience was about him being corrected because when he's blinded, what is the first thing he says? Lord. Why? <laughs> he calls him, he calls him Lord. He like recognizes what have I, what he's got. It's like he's, yeah. it's almost as if God knows his intentions are good for persecuting the church because he has a false understanding of who God is and what the church is and who Christ was. So he thinks he's doing the right thing, but he has to be corrected by God. And so a lot of people see that as a salvation story, the road to Damascus, when really it seems more like the the story of the Jonah in the well, where he's taking one of his own people and correcting course and going, you got zeal, but you don't have right knowledge. You, you, yeah. you're, you're trying to serve me here but you're, 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 the way you're trying to serve me is inappropriate because your knowledge isn't right. I got yeah, to make sure you understand this, and I got to humble you a bit in the process. 
Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's really good. And, you know, I think it brings up a, a really important point when we think about the world in which God has placed us in the mission that he has for us. And that is we can be confident that God is working among all people and and that it is a it is a process in which he painstakingly and in which he mercifully brings people along step by step by step by step to the point where the lights finally go on and then they can say, ah, now I see it. And like Paul said, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. He could have, right? Yeah. but but he was obedient to the heavenly vision. And so we see the amazing mercy of God and we can be confident that God is at work. You know, maybe, maybe there's some right now who are listening who have uh, uh, family members or, or friends that you care very much about and you worry, are they elect or are they not elect? Well, you know, put that aside and pray like Paul, pray for their salvation and be confident that God is working in their lives to bring them along to a point where they will understand the gospel. I think it's a really good way of, of looking at it because when we understand that, that, that everyone's on a life journey, that everyone has, um, you know, light and revelation that they're held responsible yeah. for. And when you choose to suppress the light, you can become more and more hardened and calloused yeah. to those things but that's your own fault. That's not a lacking of the light or a lacking of the light giver or a lacking of a desire on part of God who created you. Um, that, that, that's a reflection of your own choices. Um, and so I, I think that's an important, valuable point as well. And one of the reasons that we do this broadcast and that we're talking about these things is because it really does emphasize the blameworthiness of those who reject the gospel because it's basically saying they're not rejecting God because God first rejected them, or they're not rejecting the gospel because it's just not understandable, uh, because they just don't have the appropriate tools to be able to understand and accept it uh, because of the way they were created somehow, or just the way they were born. No, it, th this, is, this is something they could have and should have done differently, and therefore they're all the more to blame for the rejection of the gospel. Yeah. Um, that, that's one of the, the values of this perspective, not to mention the character of God in his uh, diligence and uh, in his uh, appeal for salvation when he holds out his hand, when he weeps over them, when he expresses his longing and regret and all those kinds of things. Those are genuine emotions, genuine feelings and expressions of the scripture, yeah, not absolutely. just you know fake, if that makes sense. Yes, and, and of course that's how Paul begins Romans 9 with with his yeah. uh, grief, his never ending sorrow for his people. And one of the things I mentioned in my book is that it, it, it's emotionally, I believe at least it's emotionally impossible to be talking about such grief. I would take the curse for them, but have the doctrine of unconditional election and double predestination in his back pocket that, oh, well, God never intended for them to be saved anyway. And then later on saying, I'm praying for their salvation. It's just impossible for that to, to be the case uh, there in Romans 9 going into Romans chapter 10. Yeah. Um, Graceland Ministries, I guess, is another uh, Calvinistic source. It says, provisionism depends upon libertarian free will and middle knowledge. It makes Louis Molina better than the Apostle Paul. One, I, I've never quoted from Molina as far as I'm aware of. I don't claim to be a, a Molinist, though there are a lot of provisionists who are Molinist and nothing wrong with that. I, I'm not a philosopher by trade. I, I believed in the things that I hold to today long before I even understood and and, and uh, read about or studied the concept of libertarian free will. Um, and so this kind of accusation is the kind of accusation made by somebody who doesn't really understand what they're accusing or what they're talking about. I, I doubt, Jonathan, I, I can't speak for you, but I doubt there was anything having to do with Molina or the philosophical concepts of libertarian versus compatibilistic free will that led you to your theological conclusions. Am I right about that? You are correct about that. I hardly know what they're talking about. I've studied on a scale of one to a hundred. I've, I've studied it about two. <laughs> yeah. That's about where I am in understanding what all those things are. Because like you, Layton, I'm not a philosopher by trade either. I, I'm into the word, I'm into the history and what was going on, rather than all of this philosophical speculation about this and that. What, what yeah. does the text teach? Yeah, and, I, and I'm not 
and I, I don't think you are either, Jonathan. Neither one of us are trying to throw out philosophical arguments. There's philosophical right. discussions worth having. It's like C.S. Lewis said, philo good philosophy has to exist if for no other reason to answer bad philosophy. And I think, and I do believe de uh, that determinism is bad philosophy. And so therefore, I, I do be believe the, 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 those who, from a philosophical perspective, who argue for libertarian free will are making good, valuable cases sure. uh, from the philosophical side of things. I just don't think that those necess are necessary to answer the biblical questions that are being asked because right. I don't think the scriptures are approaching this from a primarily philosophical vantage point. And therefore, to come to a theological conclusion about what this text is discussing or that text is discussing um, doesn't require a philosophy degree or your understanding of what Molina taught about knowledge and divine knowledge and all those kinds of things or uh, wh whatever, whatever speculation you may have there. So that's just a, a yeah. misguided comment probably made from somebody who heard about something I believe second hand or third hand and and they jump on make a comment like that and probably uh, move on because th that they're not interested in really entertaining uh, sub some kind of a perspective that they don't hold to they just listen to little clips at a time and make those kinds of comments um, great light studios another great uh, podcast by the way if you're looking for a good broadcast check out um, uh, Jordan over there, he's been on our show before and I've been on his. Uh, he says, Leighton, can Dr. Williams comment on Romans 10 and 11 and how they might impact how we understand Romans 9 and the fate of the hardened vessels of wrath? You want to yeah. take a stab at that one, Jonathan? Yeah, I will. Let me begin with the last three verses, <clears throat> three or four verses of Romans 9. I find it interesting that when Paul arrives at his initial conclusion, which we know as the latter part of Romans 9, that would have been the perfect place as he's wrapping it all up that would have been the perfect place to say and so now we see that they are not israel who say they are descended from israel because god never intended them all to be israel because he elected some to be saved and not others that would have been yeah. the spot but he didn't make it what did he talk about he talked about faith he said they stumbled not because they're not elect they stumbled because they were pursuing it by works rather than by faith and then he goes on into chapter 10 and he talks uh, he says that basically in the first four verses and i forget where it is in my book and my book is coming out by the way uh next week we'll release it we're making final uh, edits on it but uh, when you go into chapter 10 you find at least eight verses i believe they use the word faith or believing the, the whole emphasis turns into faith this is what distinguishes those who, who are Israel, the Israel of God, versus those who have been hardened. It's not election. It's faith that distinguishes the, the two. Yeah. And so that's what it's, chapter... So it's not monergism versus synergism or Calvinism versus Arminianism. Uh, it is faith versus works. It's Correct. establishing a covenant of... It's establishing covenant with people because of their lineage and their works versus establishing covenant with those by grace through faith. That's, that's the dichotomy, right. which yeah. which I, we can put this on the screen. You just yeah. referenced it. This yeah. is the, in the section that we talked about. This is what shall we say then? This is his own commentary of what he's just gotten through saying. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, Dr. Williams was just referring to. This would have been a perfect time. What shall we say then? Well, Calvinism must be true. And so something Calvinistic should follow. What shall we say then? And, and therefore draw out the whole monergism versus synergism. What shall we say then? Um, you know, it's it's certain individuals that have been elect for salvation and others have been uh, condemned for damnation or something of that nature. But instead, he draws out the national differences between uh, Israel pursuing the law uh, and they're not attaining it. But the, the Jews, uh, the Gentiles who are pursuing it through faith, they are attaining it. So the pursuit, there's nothing wrong with the pursuit. It's, it's what you're, how you're pursuing it. If you're pursuing it through works uh, and through nationality, because you're you're a descendant of Israel, then you're not going to attain it. But if you're you're pursuing it through faith, then guess what? That that's that's where you true tr find true righteousness is by pr pursuing it through the stumbling stone through Christ. Uh, and so that then you, then you're getting there into uh, the first few chapters, uh, first few verses of ten. So yeah, proceed on. That that's good stuff. Well, I just I just turned in my in my book to all the references to faith or believing. I've, there are nine references to faith in chapter 10. 
And so that's that's a whole emphasis. That's where Paul goes, because that's what he was arguing that that was his battle in the first century. It was the word. Are we justified by the works of the Torah? Is that how Israel is going to be vindicated before God? And is it by our, our lineage? And he says, no, it's by faith in the Messiah, which is what enables the Gentiles to come in. So that's how chapter 10 relates to it. Then we get into chapter 11 of uh, the book of Romans. And, uh, and we see that, well, God has not rejected his people. I, uh, verse 1, be, uh, for I myself am, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew because I'm saved. Then he goes into the whole remnant uh, uh, theology here. Verses 5 through 7 um, is very interesting also because he talks about, um, where is it in verse 5? So at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And so many Calvinists have, have pointed that also. But notice that grace is not contrasted with faith. Grace is contrasted with works there. Gra and, right, and, it doesn't, and it doesn't say unconditionally chosen. In yes. other words, he's choosing the faithful. <laughs> so it's the, those who have refused to bow and need a bail that he has chosen them by grace. Yes. Uh, they, they don't deserve it. Th those who refuse to bow and need a bail are sinners. They've all fallen short. Yeah. Um, just because they they have faith doesn't mean they don't need a Messiah. They they need grace. Yes. And so these these this remnant who have this remnant who have not bowed and need a bail have been chosen by grace. You can't assume um, the word unconditional is imposed on that word based upon a misreading or a mishandling of an earlier passage. Yes. Um, you, you have to establish that in this text, and it, it's just not established. But that's, go that's ahead. Right. I'd like to say that grace and faith are not antonyms, but grace yeah. and works are antonyms. Faith is always implied there when, when we're talking about the grace of God. So then he goes on and he talks about the hardening. He talks about those who were hardened, the Israelites, the, the, the same ones in uh, in chapter 9. And then he quotes from uh, the Psalms here, what, what David says, a, a spirit of super, a stupor, eyes that uh, would not see, ears that cannot hear, down to this down to this very day. So he's talking about his current generation. Then he quotes from David. But then in verse 11, he says, they... It's very important to identify who the they is. The they are the hardened ones of chapter nine. They did not. And you know that because right there, it's yeah. you just now a contrast the elect yes. versus the rest who are hardened. And so he's still talking about the hardened ones Correct. right here when he says, and they, the hardened ones, did they stumbled. They're same ones in chapter nine that stumbled. So go, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so that's that's okay. By no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel, the unbelieving part of Israel, jealous. So Paul still holds out hope that they will be saved. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, or their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So, so I, I'm not going to re re read the whole text here, but we see here that. Paul in chapter 11 is talking about the same people that he talked about in chapter 9. And Paul has not given up on them, but Paul holds out hope for their salvation. And I believe that the greatest verse of all is verse 23. If he can go down to verse 23, where uh, he says, uh, and even, even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. The ones who have been cut out can come back in, for God has the power to graft them in again. So we right. see that the that the hardened, that the non-elect in chapter nine cannot refer to an eternal predestination to hell, because Paul still out hope, still holds out hope for their salvation. Well, and a couple of other things here. Notice the reason they were broken off was not arbitrarily before they were born, just like unconditionally broken okay. off. They they were broken off because of something. Just like Edomites were broken off or hated because of their attack of Israel, so too. There's a broken, breaking off of Israel because of their unbelief. So that there's a reason for their being broken off. There's a reason for their stumbling. Okay, And so just because they've been broken off and stumbled doesn't make them a reprobate that never has a hope of salvation. Because right. if they haven't stumbled beyond recovery, they can't be the reprobate in Calvinism. This doesn't right. make sense. And in verse 14, it even says that that jealousy that you spoke of earlier might lead some of them to be saved. Yes. Thus, save some of them. How does a reprobate ever get the hope of salvation? He can't. He was born reprobate. 
And, and if you're going to use this verse to say the elect, the unconditionally chosen ones, obtained it, but the rest, the reprobated ones, are hardened, if that's the way you're going to interpret that text, like Calvinists typically tr apply this passage, then you've got to be able to explain how that works with chapter uh, verses 11 through 23. Yeah. And the best thing, the only thing I've ever seen a, a Calvinist do in dealing with this section of the scripture is what I heard James White do in his conversation uh, with um, Austin Fisher. He shifted and said, well, he's speaking corporate terms there. So all along the way, he says it's about individual salvation, but here Paul shifts to speak more corporately. And that's, that's the way the Calvinist has to deal with this passage. There, there's no other way to, for them to deal with this passage than to shift from an individual application to a corporate application versus understanding it's a corporate application all the way through. I mean, yeah. he's, he's speaking corporately the whole because, way through. Because that it's same amazing. argument is, is used against non-Calvinists in chapter 9. They say, oh, it's talking about salvation in verses 1 through 5, but you say it's uh, the election is corporate in verses 6 through 13. And, and so they, they shifted there. And, and I didn't know that James White did that um, later in chapter 11. Yeah, yeah I, qu I quote him in my book talking about that. And um, and, it, and it's interesting, like you said, with Moo and some of the other commentators, they, they will use that same kind of corporate language in much of their explanations of those verses, but then ex inexplicably still bring out a, a Calvinistic inclusion. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it just, it, it's sometimes baffling. Um, so... Let's just uh, inter in engage with Aaron here. Aaron says, God is not grafting back in those fitted for destruction. He is grafting back in the natural branches, but in particular, those beloved by God due to the promise made to their forefathers. Um, well, if, if they're f the fitted for destruction are those who are cut off in their unbelief. Right. So if you're fitted for destruction, it's because you're cut off in your unbelief. But yet Paul still holds out hope that they will leave their unbelief so as to be grafted back in and thus not fitted for destruction. So I'm not sure how he can make that argument. It's just he seems to be just ad hoc claiming that it, it's not applied to those. But I don't know how you can not apply it to the hardened, the same hardened people throughout this whole section. Right. He's still he's still referring to those same hardened Israelites. And yeah. yes, those are individual Israelites. So there's not it's not just about corporations. There are individual Israelites who are cut off in their unbelief because of their unbelief, who Paul holds out hope will leave their unbelief so as to be saved. I think what Aaron is saying is, well, the ones who, who might be saved in Romans 11, they're elect anyway. And uh, I, I've, I've had somebody share that with me one time. Well, they're elect anyway. So, and, and it just does not make logical sense. I think, I think too, if we, if we go back to chapter 10 and in verse 1, and it's very... Uh, important to look at those pronouns. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. And Which implies they're not saved yet, yes. obviously. <laughs> right. Yeah. So who is who is the them that he's referring to in context? It has to be the ones in chapter nine that he's been talking. Yeah. I'm praying for their salvation. Yeah, so, well, I mean, remember the chapter breaks not there, and you got to you got to remember he's he who 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 is the people he's praying for, the Israelites who did not pursue it by faith, but though it were by works, and they have stumbled over the stumbling stone. That's who he's praying for. He's right. praying for the stumbling hardened Jews that he started off this whole chapter talking about in verses one through three that he would give up his own salvation for. And Paul, my brothers, is not more merciful than the Christ he serves. Mm -hmm. and, and to say that Christ didn't die for these people because they're reprobates, but, but Paul was willing to? Paul was willing to give up his own salvation for them, but Jesus wasn't willing to die for them? Do, do you hear the words that are coming out of your mouths, brothers? Yeah. That you would say Paul, Paul would be absolutely just horrified that people would draw the conclusion that he is more merciful and self-sacrificially loving than the Christ he follows. That is absolutely, you are, in fact. Um, if Aaron's in the side chat, uh, you would gladly give up your salvation or gladly even give up your life, if nothing else, to, to save your child, let's say, or to save your wife or your loved one, right? Are you more self-sacrificially loving than Jesus? Yeah. 
You must be if you're willing to do that for one of the reprobates in the world, but Jesus wasn't. I don't know how a Calvinist can come, at least a five-point Calvinist, can come to that kind of conclusion to say, ultimately, they and Paul are more self-sacrificially willing to give up their own lives for the salvation of another, but Christ wasn't. Yeah. That, that's that's a baffling, baffling belief yeah, uh, indeed to me. It is. <laughs> indeed it is. Well, and, it, and we didn't mention this, but he bookends, if you have a bookend in a chapter, uh, even though we mentioned that the, the chapter is... Uh, Divisions aren't ever in the, the original, but he ends the chapter not only saying his desire, but he's saying this is God's desire. God says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. In other words, I wanted their salvation. I longed to gather them like a mother hen gathers the chicks under her wings, but they were unwilling. Um, this, is, this is not just the expression of Paul. This is the expression of God himself over and over and over again to these people. Well, uh, Leighton, a Calvinist will say, and, and I have quotes from Piper on this. Um, he, he commented on Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 about the, the patience of God leads us to repentance. The, kind, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. And, and he says that, that God does draw people to himself out of love, but then he pushes them away out of that hatred. And it, it's, it's just insane. I, I as, ju as judgment. Yeah, for yeah. their unbelief. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I cannot, yeah, I cannot believe it. I, uh, chapter nine of my book, I call the, um, the title of the chapter is the dreadful destination, <laughs> where Cal Calvinism ends. That God, with one hand, is drawing people uh, to Himself, but on the other, on the other hand, by His predetermined decision to reprobate them and to cast them into hell forever to show His glory and His holiness, He's pushing them away. And well, that doesn't show his glory or his holiness. That shows that not shows him to be duplicitous. You know, uh, yes, it exactly. shows him not to be genuine in his offer or his appeals. It yeah. it, it, it makes God look bad. Yes. Um, it's, and it's that's and that's that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. We could probably theology geek out about these kinds of things yeah. all day long, Doctor Williams. But I wanted to say thank you for your work um, again for our listeners. the The link is in the show notes where you can find more from Jonathan. Um, and his work, um, also his the new book that will be coming out. I'm sure you can also find it at that link because it's a link to his his uh, current website, and uh, you can find out uh, any of the work that he's putting out there. Um, and hopefully, maybe when you get the the second book published, the one on uh, verses 10 through 13, the the Edomites enigma. When you get that done, you can come back on. And we can maybe talk through that as well um, a little bit a little bit further once that what's that once that once that's gone to press, so to speak. But I, I do appreciate very much you coming on. Is there anything else you would like to share with the audience as far as how they can get a hold of you or learn more about your ministry? Um, just uh, go to my website, wgsministries.org. And if you want to email me personally, just put my first name there in front of the website address, Jonathan at wgsministries.org. And that's my email address, and that's how you can get in touch with me. Awesome. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks for those in the side comments, all the questions and uh, feedback we appreciate. And uh, really do appreciate those who support this ministry. Thank you, those who give on a regular basis to make this possible. If you'd like to become a, a monthly patron or make a one-time donation, the link is in the show notes of how you can support this ministry. And remember, check out Jonathan's material as well. The link is in the show notes so that you can find his information and his uh, information on his book so that you can pick that up. And I'd love to hear your reviews about that. I know Jonathan would as well. Yeah. Um, so if you read his work and you appreciate what he has to say, he already told you how to get a hold of him through email, please send him some encouragement. Um, you can also put uh, comments in this video on YouTube and Jonathan will be able to see those as well. Yeah. So that always encourages an author whenever you read his work and give uh, commentary on things that you're learning from it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, encourage Dr. Williams and his work because we need more people like him uh, with PhDs behind their names uh, who are willing to do the, the hard scholarly work uh, needed to, I, I think, combat uh, the otherwise rising uh, wave of uh, Calvinistic theology that's happening in our, our culture today. And so I, I think that uh, more work like this from Dr. Williams is needed and we need to help promote it. One thing uh, Calvinists have done a really good job at over the years, much better than any of the Arminians or Provisionists or uh, any, any other groups have done, is they have promoted their scholars. Uh, 
Um, they, they, they make sure everybody knows about uh, the works and teachings of John Piper and MacArthur's and the other uh, Calvinists of today. Um, and they have big, huge conferences with huge budgets behind them uh, promoting these, these, these works. And uh, the Christian bookstores are just lined, shelves just lined, <laughs> uh, stock full of uh, re reformed materials, Calvinistic reformed materials, and, and so little uh, from the other perspective from our scholars out there. And so um, you're the ones who help make that happen. And when I say you, I mean the general public. When we purchase things and when we tweet about them and when we like and share videos, mm -hmm. that's how the word gets out. Um, I remember, and I know, Jonathan, you, you and I are both old enough to remember the day when nobody knew who John Piper was. Right. And he's older than you are. I mean, he's in his yeah. upper 70s, if not in 80s now. Um, MacArthur, very, I remember a day when MacArthur wasn't all that known. Um, a matter of fact, the Founders Ministry and the Southern Baptist Convention was a very small fledgling group of people. Um, Calvinists were not predominantly known in Southern Baptist world or, or regarded as leaders within the Southern Baptist community. Now, the, uh, the, almost every major position is held by Calvinist uh, and, and seminaries and throughout the Southern Baptist Convention. And so that's only happened in, the, in my lifetime or even the last three decades. Um, and so I, I'm trying to look to the future here and say, what is my children and my grandchildren, who are, who are the scholars they're going to be listening to and, and studying? Um, who, who are the people that, um, that are gonna be coming through the next generation of, of leaders? Who, what are they gonna be teaching? with regard to God's salvation and the sovereignty of God and what that really means in the context of scripture. And so you have to help make that happen by purchasing these kinds of resources, recommending these kinds of resources and getting them in the hands of our bookstores and our seminaries and in our, the, the hands of our students for future generations. And so thank you, Dr. Williams, for helping make that kind of material available to the church and for future generations. And I will remind you, as I always do, go now, share Christ and show love. God bless. Amen.